Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Genetic Testing and Diagnosis of PMS and HSD with Lauren Perrier. My name is Sarah Jo. I'm the Volunteer Coordinator at the Ehlers-Danlos Society, and I am your moderator today. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. So this is how today's webinar is going to work. Webinar attendees will be muted at all times during the webinar. However, you are able to type any questions you may have throughout the presentation into the question box at any time. Lauren will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A portion at the end of her presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once. It will not increase your chances of having your question answered. It will only make it harder to sift through and make sure that we're able to get to as many questions as possible. Lauren Perrier joined the Genetic Medicine Clinic at the University of Washington Medical Center in 2016. She provides genetic counseling to patients referred to the clinic for a variety of conditions with particular interest in vascular ehlers danlos and other connective tissue disorders. Ms. Perrier received her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from Stanford University and worked as an educator and mediator before returning to school to study genetics. She received her Master of Science in Human Genetics and Genetic Counseling from Stanford University and was board certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling in 2016. Thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thank you, Sarah Jo. I'm going to see if my slides show up. Can you see them? All right. So I'm going to talk today about genetic testing and diagnosis of EDS and HSD. And uh, as Sarah Jo said, I'm a genetic counselor at the University of Washington. I work here in this um, once in a lifetime picture of the sun shining on the University of Washington Genetic Medicine Clinic. And we see patients for a wide variety of genetic conditions, but I have a particular interest in connective tissue disorders. And so I see the vast majority of patients who come to our clinic for that indication. So, um, as I said, I work here at the University of Washington in Seattle at the Genetic Medicine Clinic. We're primarily an adult clinic and we see people for all kinds of genetic conditions. But I have a special interest in connective tissue disorders, so I see most patients who come through our clinic, um, along with Peter Byers, who's our medical geneticist who specializes in EDS and connective tissue disorders. Here is my plan for the talk today. I'll talk about how are EDS and HSD diagnosed currently. Um, I'll give you a little bit of basic information about clinical genetic testing so that you know what I mean when I say we have genetic testing to offer um, for some types of EDS. And then I'll give you specifics about what does that look like for EDS. Um, and I'll finish by answering a question that people ask me pretty frequently, which is why is there not a genetic test for hypermobile EDS or hypermobility spectrum disorder? Um, and I don't know, I mean, we don't know for sure what the reason is that it's been so difficult, but I'll give you some ideas. So the acronyms that you might see on my slides, hopefully everybody who's here knows that EDS is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, HSD is Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder. And then specific types of EDS are um, typically written as shown here with the lowercase letter for, to signify which type we're talking about. And then I wanna be um, very clear when I start talking about genetic variants, that basically what that means is a difference in a particular gene from the typical DNA sequence that we expect to see in that gene. And there's lots of genetic variation between people. So just because somebody has a genetic variant in a particular gene doesn't mean that it causes any kind of a problem. When we find a variant that causes a problem, we call it a pathogenic or disease-causing variant. So I'll try to be very good about saying pathogenic variant when that's what I mean. So first of all, how are EDS and HSD diagnosed right now? Ideally, when you have some sort of symptoms um, of a condition, you go to your primary care provider or whoever your healthcare provider is, and you say, here's what's going on with me, what do I have? And they walk you down this path to try and figure out a diagnosis. It might include a clinical exam, maybe some history about you or about family members. In some cases, there's genetic testing available for some diagnoses. And then you get to this um, end point where they say, OK, this is what you have. Here's the answer. Unfortunately, when it comes to diagnosing EDS and HSD, a lot of patients' path looks more like this. It can be a terrible, terrible struggle to figure out even what to call um, the symptoms that somebody is having. 
Some of the reasons for this include that a lot of healthcare providers don't know much about EDS or don't realize that there are different types that are each a different genetic condition. Sometimes people say their providers don't take their symptoms seriously, and so they don't get a workup to try and figure out what's going on. The symptoms for a lot of types of EDS can be sort of nonspecific, particularly for hypermobile EDS. Um, it's hard without objective findings. You know, people don't see something on your joint x-ray, and so they say you can't be having that much joint pain. Um, and sometimes those symptoms can overlap with other conditions, and so people get worked up for autoimmune disorders or, you know, other kinds of rheumatologic things. Um, and misdiagnoses are very common. People often get to EDS as like a third or fourth or, you know, more, even more than that, more diagnoses that they've cycled through before they've actually landed where they belong. So to try and address these issues, a group got together in 2017. Um, and those of you who have been in the EDS community for a while may recognize some of the names here. These are folks who really are very familiar with these conditions. And they tried to sort out a classification and provide some diagnostic criteria for different types of EDS um, with the hope that more providers would be able to make these diagnoses appropriately for patients. In this paper, the diagnostic criteria for EDS, mostly, most of the types of EDS have major and minor clinical criteria and um, you know, some sort of a formula. You have to have this many major and this many minor to get the clinical diagnosis for that type of EDS. Most types also have genetic testing to confirm that diagnosis, so you can be really certain um, in many cases of what that diagnosis is once someone suspects the right thing and knows to go look for it. The exception is hypermobile EDS. It doesn't have major and minor criteria and it doesn't have a genetic test right now to confirm that diagnosis. So in a lot of ways, it's the most difficult type of EDS to diagnose. The way that this classification system um, sorted out diagnosis, I will talk about in the next slide. But here I've just got a list of um, some of the rarer types of EDS that all have genetic diagnosis available. And then on the other hand, um, the hypermobile EDS and hypermobility spectrum disorder that are still at this point a clinical diagnosis. All right, so how is that clinical diagnosis made? The criteria for hypermobile EDS are here. There are three criteria, and you have to meet all three to get the clinical diagnosis in this classification system. So you have to have generalized joint hypermobility, um, which is why hypermobile EDS is called hypermobile. The second criterion, you have to have at least two of those features. And the paper goes into quite a bit of detail about what are the systemic features of connective tissue disorders that would qualify you for A, for example. Um, or what kinds of musculoskeletal complications are we talking about? So I'm not going to get into detail about that. Um, and then the third criterion, you have to exclude alternative diagnoses that might overlap with some of the symptoms that you can see in hypermobile EDS. So again, there's that workup that I referenced earlier where you have to rule out other connective tissue conditions and autoimmune and neuromuscular. And so people go through a huge process to get labeled with this diagnosis to have hypermobile EDS confirmed. Um, and it can be very, very frustrating. And clinical diagnosis is not perfect. Um, you probably noticed that those criteria were very strict. And the reason for that is that the group didn't want people who don't have hypermobile EDS to get labeled with that diagnosis. So they wanted to make those criteria very stringent to only catch people who truly do have hypermobile EDS. But that means that some other people who actually do have the condition are going to be missed. They're not going to meet those strict criteria. For whatever reason, there's one feature they don't have, and so they don't get um, that diagnosis that they should have. And at this point, the best system that people have come up with is that if you have hypermobility and some of those related issues, but you don't meet those criteria for hypermobile EDS, you often will get diagnosed with hypermobility spectrum disorder, um, which is probably just somewhere along the same spectrum of that condition. But um, that's what happens currently until we figure out genetic testing or some sort of um, more definitive way to see who actually has a condition and who doesn't. Who can make these diagnoses? Genetics providers certainly can diagnose um, types of EDS, and some will also diagnose HSD. Although many genetics clinics have a a long waiting list. Um, there are not enough genetics providers in this country 
um, or actually in any country that I'm aware of. And a lot of clinics have instituted really strict referral criteria. So sometimes people who have a suspected diagnosis of EDS don't meet the referral criteria to be seen in genetics. And in that case, um, we've had success with patients getting diagnosed by rheumatologists, cardiologists, primary care providers, depending on what kinds of symptoms they have. Um, a lot of those other providers are now becoming more and more comfortable making a diagnosis of EDS or HSD. And for the types of EDS where genetic testing is available, that's a nice way to make a definitive diagnosis for a provider who's not entirely sure whether somebody meets clinical criteria. I will um, warn you, and I'll talk more about this, to look out for consumer-ordered genetic tests. If you're looking for a diagnostic test, um, many of those consumer ordered tests are not going to give you the answer that you're looking for. So when we say we're going to send genetic testing to confirm somebody's diagnosis, what are we talking about? I'll give you a little bit of background here. So flashback to high school biology, if that's something that you took. Um, many of the types of cells in our bodies have a nucleus. Um, you can see they've got little chromosomes floating around in there. Those are packages of genetic information. And this chromosome here that's um, enlarged, you can see it's just made up of a long, coiled-up strand of DNA. So that's how all of our genetic information is packaged in our cells. And this is how it gets passed down from parents to children. Chromosomes come in pairs. You get one copy in each pair from mom and one from dad. And the, the pairs are matched. So in chromosome number one, you've got all the same genes from mom that you have in the copy of chromosome number one that you get from dad. So you've got two copies of just about every gene in your body, um, aside from genes that are on the sex chromosomes, the X and Y, things work a little differently. But when we're thinking about EDS, we're not thinking about the sex chromosomes. We're thinking about pairs of chromosomes and having two copies of each gene that causes any type of EDS. So if we zoom in a little bit and look at a gene, it's just a segment of DNA that contains instructions for the cell to make a protein product that it needs for some purpose. So there are genes that tell the cell how to make collagen. There are genes that tell the cell how to make enzymes for digesting milk or how to make pigment for your skin color. Lots and lots of different things that are all encoded in those instructions in different genes. When the laboratory is asked to analyze a gene when we send genetic testing and we say, hey, we think it's this condition, look at this gene. The lab will extract DNA from a blood sample or a saliva sample usually, and they will run that DNA through a sequencing machine. And it will just say, here's the order of the DNA bases in this gene, here's what it looks like in this person. So you just get a string of letters, and there are only four DNA bases. So you can see it's just four letters rearranged um, in a particular order that makes up the spelling of the instructions for this gene. Then the laboratory will compare what this gene looks like in this person to a reference sequence. So is it different or the same as what we typically expect to see in most people in this gene? And when the laboratory finds something that's different, that's a genetic variant. Um, and as I said before, that's not necessarily a variant that causes a problem. That's the next thing the laboratory has to figure out is when they find something, does it matter? Does it change how these instructions work? Or can a cell still make the normal protein product from the instructions in this gene? So that technology is called gene sequencing, where the lab is looking at the whole sequence of the gene, all, all the DNA um, bases that code for making a protein. Laboratories also will look for larger changes in genes. So they'll look for a large deletion or duplication, a missing or extra chunk of DNA in that gene. And most labs these days can actually find those large deletions or duplications from their sequencing data. So they may just need that, um, it's called next generation sequencing technology to be able to find both of these types of genetic variants. Some labs still do a separate technology to look for deletions and duplications if they're not confident that they'll see them on sequencing um, for reasons that I won't get into. But any lab that's doing clinical testing is going to be able to tell you if there's a sequence variant or if there's a deletion or duplication in the gene. And that's how we know that it's a good clinical test. They're gonna find <clears throat> all of those common kinds of genetic variants that cause disease. If you order a consumer-ordered genetic test, like an ancestry test or some of the ones that give you information about traits and health, most of those consumer-ordered tests are using a different technology, which is called genotyping. 
And genotyping just looks at specific pre-selected spots in the genome. So they're not looking at the sequence of the whole gene. They're not gonna be able to find larger chunks that are missing or extra. They're just saying at this spot where we expect to see an A, do we see an A? Um, the drawback of this is of course, you're missing a bunch of information that might be important. And the accuracy is also less certain. So we know that these tests um, that do genotyping have false positives that aren't confirmed when we do more robust clinical testing. We assume they probably have false negatives, although people don't come in and say, I didn't get anything turned back on this test. I had a negative test result. Can you confirm that it's actually negative? Um, and these tests also have more frequent failed reads where they just don't get an answer about what's at a particular spot. They say, is it an A at this spot? And the test doesn't give them anything. Um, the health risks that are identified by these um, kinds of consumer ordered tests are sometimes very small differences and they don't usually take into account your personal and family history, which for some common conditions like diabetes or heart disease, your family history may be much more important than these small genetic um, risks that give you a little bit higher or a little bit lower chance to develop that condition. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that third-party interpretation services, so the websites where you can take your raw data from your consumer ordered test and you can upload it and they'll give you a lot more interpretation than what the original test gave you, these services are completely unregulated. Nobody is checking to see how valid um, their information is. And I can tell you from experience from looking at some patient tests and information they got from third-party services, a lot of it is not based on good science. Um, so I would caution you to read the fine print when you're ordering genetic testing. And as it says in those fine print messages, you know, talk to your healthcare provider before you change anything based on that kind of a test because um, those tests are not clinical. They're not considered diagnostic grade tests. All right, so the next piece that I wanna talk about is how are conditions inherited in families, particularly conditions like EDS and HSV? There are a couple of common inheritance patterns that we can see in different types of EDS. So some types of EDS are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, which is what's shown here in this family tree. Um, you can see that from my key, the shaded in blue people are affected, they have the condition, and the people who are white don't have the condition. Um, Autosomal just means not sex-linked, so autosomal dominant inheritance means it doesn't discriminate between men and women, it can be passed down from a father or a mother, and it can be passed to a son or a daughter. The dominant piece means that it only takes one pathogenic variant in one copy of the gene to give the person the condition. So if we look here and say, okay, here's the two copies of the gene for this condition that each parent has in the family, and dad, you can see, has two normal copies of the gene. He doesn't have this condition. He doesn't have um, any pathogenic variant in that gene. Mom has a pathogenic variant in one copy of the gene, so it's not working properly. It can't make its normal protein product. And so when these people have kids, they each get to pass on one copy of the gene each time they have a child. So dad is passing on a normal copy or another normal copy. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, all the kids are going to get a normal copy of this gene from him. And for mom, it's going to be a 50-50 chance. You can see she's either passing on one copy or the other, and only one of those has a pathogenic variant. So you can guess from which kids are shaded in who inherited that pathogenic variant from mom and who didn't. So this dominant inheritance pattern, we can see conditions being passed down from generation to generation throughout a family. The other type of inheritance that um, applies to other types of EDS is autosomal recessive inheritance. And I will show you a list a little bit later of which types of EDS follow which of these patterns. In this key, you can see that people are either unaffected or they are carriers for a condition or they're affected and they actually have it. And so in this example, mom and dad um, in this family are both carriers. We don't expect carriers for an autosomal recessive condition to have any features of the condition. So mom and dad may not even know that they're carriers for the same condition. And you can see here, they've each got one pathogenic variant, not necessarily the same pathogenic variant. It might be a different change in that gene that stops it from working in each of them. Um, or if mom and dad are closely related to each other, they might have the same pathogenic variant if they have a common ancestor. We see that certainly in genetics as well. 
But either way, they've got one working copy of that gene and one copy that has that pathogenic variant and isn't doing its normal job. But in a recessive condition, that doesn't matter for them. It just matters when they have children that there are four possible combinations that could get passed on. So you can see here, they could have a child who gets two normal copies and doesn't have the condition and isn't even a carrier for it. Um, they could have a child that carries mom's pathogenic variant or a child that carries dad's pathogenic variant. And so they're both carriers, but they don't have the condition just like mom and dad. Or, or the fourth possibility, um, that both mom and dad pass on their pathogenic variants to the same child and they don't have any working copies of that gene. And then that's the kid who's going to have the condition. So for this inheritance pattern in families, we often will see a couple of siblings who have the same type of EDS, but nobody else in the generation above or below because two carriers or a carrier and somebody who has the condition have to have a child um, together for that child to have a possibility of getting two pathogenic variants. The other thing that can happen um, and does happen commonly in some types of EDS is that a person can be the first person in their family to have a condition because they have a brand new mutation or a de novo variant that happens just in them. And the way that this works is that every time cells in your body divide to make new cells, they copy their genetic information and they're not always perfect. So little changes happen in this copying process. If changes happen when cells are copying their information to make a sperm cell or make an egg cell, then that new genetic change, that de novo variant, can go on to create a pregnancy and that person will have it in all of the cells of their body. Um, but the parent who that cell came from doesn't have it in any other cells. So it's brand new just in the new person who's created by that um, germ cell that carries the de novo variant. And we all have some of these. So every one of us has some variants in our genome that were not inherited, that are brand new in us. But in a lot of cases, those variants happen, <clears throat> pardon me, in a gene that doesn't cause a health problem or maybe in a piece of DNA that's not part of a gene. So we don't always know. Um, those variants don't always make themselves known. Some conditions have higher rates of de novo mutations than others. So we know, um, you know, some conditions are almost always inherited. It's almost always something that's passed down. And some conditions, half or more of people who have that condition are the first person in their family. And there are just some differences between genes. So some genes are more prone to these kinds of variants than others. Um, and so that's what makes the difference in these percentages. Usually de novo variants cause dominant forms of EDS because you can imagine the chance of having one new variant that falls into a gene that causes a problem um, is certainly higher than the chance of having two new variants in the same gene coming from two different parents. That's just um, incredibly unlikely. So typically we see these de novo variants in dominant forms of EDS. And once that person has the pathogenic variant in them and they have the condition, then it just follows a traditional autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. It can be passed to children with that 50-50 chance. So a little summary about genetic variants. Clinical genetic testing uses sequencing technology. Make sure you're looking for that if you're having a genetic test. When the laboratory finds a variant, they have to classify it and decide, does it cause a problem or not? And depending on the inheritance pattern, um, <clears throat> genetic diagnosis may involve finding one pathogenic variant in a gene or finding two pathogenic variants in both copies of the gene in a person. When you do have genetic testing, there are some possible test results that can come back. And we like to warn people, you could have a positive test, um, meaning that the lab finds a pathogenic genetic variant, and that's the answer. You have a diagnosis. You could have a negative genetic test, meaning the lab didn't find a genetic variant or they only found things that they could just classify as benign and not even report. Most labs don't tell you if they find benign variants because they're benign. Um, and in this case, you've typically ruled out a diagnosis to the best of our ability, um, but we don't have an answer for why a person has the symptoms they have. The third possible type of test result is a variant of uncertain significance. And this means that the lab found a genetic variant, but they just don't have enough evidence to know whether it's normal variation between people, which we all have lots of, or whether it causes a problem in that gene and might be associated with a health condition. Pardon me, I'm getting 
quite scratchy voiced. Um, <clears throat> what I tell patients about variants of uncertain significance is that they are quite common. I would say probably 10 to 20% of genetic tests that I send, if we're looking at multiple genes, so looking at a panel of genes, we get back a variant of uncertain significance. So this is something we expect to find some percentage of the time. It's the laboratory's job to keep trying to reclassify that variant. If they're able to do that in the future, they will let your provider know, and then your provider will do everything they can to contact you and let you know. And the other thing that I find quite reassuring about these results is that if we look back at historical data of variants of uncertain significance that laboratories were able to reclassify as they got more information, 90% of them turn out to be benign. They're just normal genetic variation between people and they don't cause any kind of health problems. So we don't do anything differently for people in terms of their medical care when we find a variant of uncertain significance. We usually just take sort of a wait and see approach um, and that's something to talk about with your healthcare provider if it happens, obviously. Um, but I just like to warn people up front, if you're thinking about having genetic testing, this is a definitely a possible test result that you might get. All right, so that was kind of general genetic testing considerations. Um, what about doing genetic testing for types of EDS? So I'll go back to this list of types that have a genetic diagnosis versus a clinical. And I've color coded them here so you can see the types that are in sort of that reddish orange color um, are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. And the ones that are still in that sort of dark gray are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. Um, typically the most rare types are recessive conditions because you have to have two pathogenic variants coming from both parents. Um, you might notice on here that myopathic EDS has been reported with both inheritance patterns. And you also might notice that I have labeled hypermobile EDS and hypermobility spectrum disorder as having an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, even though we don't know the gene or genes that cause those conditions. And the reason for that is that when we look at big families that have hypermobile EDS um, or HSD, it looks like a dominant pattern of inheritance. We see it passed down from generation to generation, just as it would be um, in sort of typical autosomal dominant inheritance. So we think that's gonna turn out to be the story when we, when we do find genes and we do know, um, we can track that inheritance in the family. For the types of EDS that currently have genetic diagnosis, these are the genes that we would think about. Um, most people, if they do genetic testing, they're not doing all of these genes because there's some clinical features that make people suspect a particular type of EDS. Um, so usually we're just looking at whatever type we think a person has. Um, you might notice that some of these have two genes associated. That does not mean that you need pathogenic variants in both genes. Usually it's because the two genes work together in some way. Um, so like for classical EDS, Col5A1 and Col5A2 are the two building blocks that make type 5 collagen. So if you have a pathogenic variant in Col5A1, that type 5 collagen is abnormal. Or if you have a pathogenic variant in Col5A2, that type 5 collagen is abnormal. So either one of those genes can cause the condition if there's a pathogenic variant um, that stops that gene from working well. If you do choose to have genetic testing, I will strongly advise you to get help from somebody who's familiar with genetic testing. That could be a healthcare provider who's gonna order the test for you. Um, there are a couple of labs that do clinical genetic testing that patients can order their own test. Um, and in that case, I would say get help from a genetic counselor who works at the lab, because those labs that let people order their own tests um, that are clinical or diagnostic tests, they have genetic counselors working at the lab who are accessible to patients. So you can have somebody talk you through make sure that you're getting the test that you think you're getting, that it's gonna answer your question. Um, so if you're wondering, do I have vascular EDS? You wanna make sure that you're getting a test that's really gonna do a good analysis of that gene. Um, ask that person about costs and insurance coverage because insurance companies are so sticky about genetic testing. They really haven't caught up with how we do genetic diagnosis these days. Um, and so a lot of times patients who don't ask questions up front end up with a big bill that they weren't expecting. Um, after they've had their test. So ask about that. Make sure somebody's thinking about it for you. And then, of course, choose a lab that offers clinical testing if you have a clinical question that you want answered. Um, so don't choose a lab that does genotyping 
and that isn't going to necessarily give you um, a good diagnostic result. So what do people do with test results? Um, in some cases, it's just feeling confident in their diagnosis, um, having that piece of paper that says, yes, I have this type of EDS. Um, in other cases, people actually use that genetic information for family planning. So you can test a pregnancy if there's a known genetic variant in the family um, and see if that pregnancy is affected. Sometimes people will even do um, in vitro fertilization and create embryos in a laboratory and then they can test those embryos to see which ones inherited the known genetic variant or variants in the family, and they can transfer an embryo to create a pregnancy that doesn't have the condition. Um, but to do that, you have to have genetic test results for the person in the family who's already affected. Um, people also use test results to test family members. If somebody doesn't have a very clear clinical diagnosis, sometimes they want to rule it in or out, um, whatever diagnosis is in the family. And then finally, um, people will use their genetic test results to enroll in clinical trials or to participate in research. This is becoming more and more frequent that clinical trials are testing a medication targeted at a specific gene. And so you have to have a positive genetic test to say that you have a problem in that gene before you can qualify for the clinical trial um, because the medication is only going to work for you if you have that specific genetic diagnosis. Um, and this is just going to, I think, become huge um, in the next five to 10 years as more and more gene therapies are being tried and drugs that are targeted at specific genetic problems. So things that I hope you remember um, from this section that each type of EDS is a different condition caused by a different gene or genes. And having one type of EDS does not change your risk to have another type. So I actually will have people ask me sometimes, you know, I have classical EDS. If I have a kid, could it turn into vascular EDS? Could it, could it be a different type of EDS in them? Um, and the answer is no. Whatever you have is the thing that you have the chance to pass on. Um, and then, as you all know, probably better than I do even, people with the same type of EDS can have very, very different experiences with that condition. So just doing a genetic test and saying, yes, you have this condition and you also have this condition doesn't mean that you're gonna have the same experiences, um, even if you're closely related. People just have very different presentations with a lot of these connective tissue disorders. All right. So um, as I said, another question that I commonly get asked is, why isn't there a genetic test for hypermobile EDS when it's the most common type of EDS by far? And the answer is that we don't know for sure, um, but I can tell you some of the reasons why we think that this has been really difficult to sort out. So when researchers uh, try to identify new genes for a condition, there's a couple of different approaches that they commonly take. One is to look at the genetic information for a bunch of people who have the condition to see what do they all have in common. Is there one gene that all these people have a pathogenic variant in that might explain this condition. The other approach is to compare genetic information from affected people with genetic information from unaffected people to see what's different between those two groups. So there's some benefits and drawbacks of both approaches. If you're looking at many affected people, um, as I said, if there's one gene that they all have in common, they've all got a pathogenic variant in this gene that seems like it might cause the condition, that's a really clear and easy starting point. Um, to try and figure out what's the cause of that genetic condition. Unfortunately, if your genetic condition has multiple genetic causes, um, as we think hypermobile EDS is going to turn out to have, this becomes much more difficult. So what we think will happen is that some people will have pathogenic variants in gene X that cause hypermobile EDS in them, but other people will have pathogenic variants in gene Y that cause hypermobile EDS in them. And other people will have pathogenic variants in other genes that affect joint hypermobility. And so it becomes very difficult to look at a group of people and say, what do they all have in common that might explain this condition that clinically looks the same um, if there are multiple ways that you can arrive at joint hypermobility and some of the related symptoms. And you can imagine that joint hypermobility probably has lots and lots of factors that influence it. Um, joints are very complicated. So the other approach of um, looking at people who are affected and comparing them to people who are unaffected might be a way to get around this problem of uh, more than one causative gene. 
because if you see you know a bunch of people in the affected group who have changes in gene Y but nobody in the unaffected group has a pathogenic variant in gene Y maybe gene Y is a gene that you should look at so one problem with doing this kind of a study is how do you find unaffected people because unaffected people are not lining up at my genetics clinic and saying, hey, can you do some genetic testing to figure out why I don't have hypermobile EDS? Um, so we have to use volunteers who contribute their genetic information in some way. Um, and fortunately, in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of large population databases assembled. So we have access to a whole bunch of genetic information from the general population. Um, <clears throat> and these databases are typically um, said to contain information from healthy adults. And I think I should use finger quotes, healthy adults, right? So people who say, yes, I'm a healthy adult, I'm going to contribute to this database. Um, so we have the benefit of looking at huge amounts of information, you know, way more people than you could ever enroll in your research study. You're not going to get 100,000 volunteers to give you all their genetic data. Um, but the drawback to using these population databases is that we can't ask people about whether they have any symptoms of the condition that we're studying. And so there probably are a lot of people in these population databases who have some joint hypermobility and still consider themselves healthy adults. Maybe they even have some ongoing joint pain or some of the other symptoms that we think about with hypermobile EDS, but they don't think of that as something that makes them not a healthy adult. Um, so we don't have any way to sort out is this database truly only made up of unaffected people who don't have even any mild features of hypermobile EDS? The other way we can do this is to compare family members. So say, you know, some people in a family who have a condition and some people in the same family who don't, they share a lot of genetic information. So we can kind of rule out all that shared information and say that's not the cause. And so then figuring out what's different between family members who have a condition and don't um, is, a, is a nice way to do a smaller study and try to sort out the genetic cause. So it's possible to do clinical evaluation if you're looking at a smaller group, like a, a group of family members, um, and figure out who truly does have joint hypermobility and who doesn't. The issue with this, um, that also kind of causes problems in every sort of genetic research looking for new genes is that we don't know the penetrance of this condition. So penetrance is basically the percentage of people who have a genetic variant that should cause a condition, but they don't have any clinical features of the condition. Or I'm sorry, there, it's the percentage of people who do have clinical features of the condition. <clears throat> so we know that when we look at some genetic conditions, and this is not uncommon, we'll see that most people who have a genetic variant here in gene Y um, have clinical features of the condition. But there's these few people who have a genetic variant that should cause the condition in them, but they don't have it. They don't have any clinical features that we can see um, of that genetic condition. And so this is definitely true um, for a lot of connective tissue disorders. There are some sort of people who are outliers who don't have um, any signs of the condition that they should have based on the genetic information. And this is probably going to turn out to be true for hypermobile EDS, that there are some people who have a predisposition genetically, but don't actually develop um, any features of hypermobile EDS. So this makes it very, very complicated to sort out who's affected and who's unaffected genetically, um, even if we can figure that out clinically. So why does this happen? People will ask all the time, you know, if you have this genetic change, you should have the condition. Why would somebody not have it? Um, we call this incomplete penetrance. Why is there incomplete penetrance? And if the only gene in this family were gene Y, <clears throat> we might expect to see complete penetrance. Everybody who's got a change in that gene has the features of the condition. But these people all have 20,000 other genes. And there are lots of differences even among close relatives in the genetic information in those other genes. <coughs> Pardon me. And so you can imagine this person who is clinically unaffected, maybe they have a predisposition to hypermobility, but they also inherited some other genetic factors that make their joints stiffer. Maybe they have slightly shorter tendons. Maybe they have bulkier muscles that stabilize the joints. There's all kinds of things that they could inherit that would contribute to them not having clinical features of the condition um, that we think they ought to have. The other thing that makes a difference um, is all of these other sort of environmental 
and demographic factors. So some of these you can control and some you can't, um, but they all have an impact on how mild or severe um, people's presentations are with genetic conditions. And um, they all could be potential reasons why somebody might not show features of a condition that we think they genetically should have. So that's sort of <clears throat> a sense of some of the barriers that we think are keeping us from finding the genes for hypermobile EDS at this point. It can be really difficult to know how to tackle some of these, um, but the best way is probably to do a really, really large study, um, and that is happening now. The other thing that people ask when we talk about this is, why does it matter if we find a gene for hypermobile EDS? We have clinical criteria, we can diagnose people, even if we do identify a gene, at this point, it's probably only going to apply to a small percentage of people with hypermobile EDS. We'll have to find another gene and another gene and sort of figure out the whole range of genetic causes that can cause this condition. And at this point, a positive test isn't going to change the treatment options for people. And that's true. Um, but I work at an academic medical center. And so we will argue that more knowledge about how things work is always better. And there are a lot of... Um, a lot of examples in genetics where knowing more about the cause of a condition gives new direction for research and might actually lead to different treatments in the future. And in some cases, figuring out one mechanism for um, a disease process can actually lead to a better treatment for everybody who has that same symptom, even if it's not the same genetic cause. So really, this is how we advance knowledge, and this is how we um, eventually get to better outcomes for people. So I think that's why it matters. And I think the EDS Society agrees because they are currently um, sponsoring this really large genetic um, study to try and figure out the genetic causes of hypermobile EDS. So I'm not going to go into details about this. This isn't um, a study that I'm a part of in any way, but the EDS Society website has lots of information. Um, and I do encourage people who have a condition that is being studied to participate in research because it's rewarding in a lot of ways, um, and that's how we make things better over time. So in summary, what I kind of hope that you guys have taken away from this talk is that diagnosis can involve a bunch of different steps, clinical examination, personal and family history. In some cases, genetic testing, if it's available for the type of EDS um, that you are suspected to have. I hope, if nothing else, that you take away that not all genetic testing is clinical genetic testing, and so that you can ask some questions if you're having genetic testing to make sure you're getting the right kind of test for you. Um, I hope that you feel hopeful, as I do, that ongoing research will bring new developments in these conditions and that this talk two or three years from now may look very different, which is really exciting. And I will put in a plug for getting involved with patient organizations to stay informed. Groups like the EDS Society are one of the best ways for patients to stay connected with research and new developments because they're always aware of what's going on and they're always talking with the people who are doing the work behind the scenes. Um, so the EDS Society is one great example. There are lots of other patient groups as well. And so I encourage you to kind of find, find your people um, and keep each other informed about these things. So that's the end of what I had planned to talk about. Thank you so much for being here and participating. I want to make sure that we leave time for you to ask questions about anything that I didn't talk about that you wish I would talk about um, or anything that wasn't clear. Alrighty, thank you so much, Lauren, for a fantastic and informative webinar. We already have a bunch of questions in, but just as a reminder to our attendees, you can still type any questions you may have in the question box, and we'll try to get as many of yours answered as we can. Um, the first question we have is when there is a variant of uncertain significance on the connective tissue panel and is listed as a variant of uncertain significance, but the patient has symptoms of pathogenic variants on that gene, do you consider it pathogenic? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not going to have a satisfying answer for you, I don't think. Um, but it really depends on the circumstances. So um, if the patient has symptoms that could be a particular condition but could also be something else, we might sort of wait and see about that variant. Um, whereas if the patient has a very specific looking condition, something that really couldn't be anything else, 
then we'd be a lot more suspicious about those variants. And in some cases, we're able to go back to the laboratory um, and push them a little bit. Sometimes we test other family members so we can sort of confirm, hey, you've got these two pathogenic variants. Let's see for sure if one came from mom and one came from dad, which would give us a little bit more suspicion that this is a recessive condition. Things like that. Sometimes there's a little bit of follow-up we can do. And sometimes the best answer that we have is, you know, let's treat the symptoms you have right now and then check back with us every year or two and see if there's more information. Sometimes we just aren't able to classify it for sure and we have to kind of make our best guess about what we think is going on. All righty, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, do nutritional issues such as vitamin or mineral deficiencies influence the chances of having a copy change that causes a genetic mutation? Mm. That is a really interesting question. I am not aware of nutritional deficiencies causing more genetic mutations. Um, you know, there are certain things that we know, environmental factors that increase changes like radiation, um, you know, sun exposure, which is UV light, things like that. Um, but I'm not aware of nutritional deficiencies being a risk factor. All righty. Um, our next question is I've read somewhere that autosomal recessive genes can still cause effects with just one copy. I'm wondering about research showing a connection between HEDS and the TNXB gene. Are you aware of any research I can look into? Yeah, so it, that's really still up in the air right now. Um, there are some people who claim that having a single pathogenic variant in TNXB um, can cause some symptoms in people, but I think the science is really not there yet. So I don't have any particular research for you to read at this point, but there are people who are looking at that um, because people are suspicious that maybe it causes some sort of mild symptoms if you just have one pathogenic variant. We don't really know. Alrighty, is a skin biopsy reliable in confirming HEDS? I've been told both yes and no by doctors specialized in EDS. Ooh, that is outside my area of expertise um, because they're not doing genetic testing on the skin biopsy. They're looking at sort of the quality of the connective tissue, and I'm not sure how reliable that is. It's not something that we recommend to patients in my clinic, I can tell you that. All righty. Um, here's an interesting question. What are some ways to go about getting a, doc a diagnosis if you're adopted and have no idea of your biological family's genetic history? Yeah, that's actually a question that comes up a lot. Um, so in that case, you could have a clinical examination. You can have a personal medical history um, for what you know about your own um, health history. And then um, you know, sometimes we just have to kind of work with the information that we have. So if there's a suspicion that you have a type of EDS for which there's genetic testing, that would be one way to go. Um, if it's a suspicion of something like hypermobile EDS, some people have that even without a family history. So I think you could still get a diagnosis if you meet those clinical criteria. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next question is for kyphoscoliotic type, does the kyphosis have to be in the thoracic spine or can it also be found in the cervical spine? That's again, outside my area of expertise. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, but I do know that for a lot of these conditions, there's some variability and we don't really understand the full range of what we see in these conditions yet because a lot of them are rare. And so it's entirely possible that the kyphosis could be either place. I'm not sure what's typical and what, um, what would be still suspicious for having that condition. All righty, thank you so much for trying to answer that one. Um, for those um, attending, if your questions were one of the ones that Lauren was not completely sure about, please reach out to our helpline. You can call in, you can send an email, and we can get your questions answered there as well. Um, so the next one is, do you know if some types of EDS become worse after puberty? So, and would that sir, have genetic influence? Yeah, so there's no way to know from a genetic test result whether something's going to become worse over time or after puberty or with any other sort of um, exposure or thing that happens in your life. But we do know that people see changes in how their condition manifests over time. And so it's entirely possible that that influx of hormones in puberty might change how things um, look for people. We also know that things um, sometimes improve with age. So like joint hypermobility that causes people problems tends to get a little bit better over time as they age and their joints naturally get stiffer. So um, yeah, it certainly could, certainly could change. All righty. 
um, we had an attendee that had a complete genetic test with their primary physician. Mm -hmm. And they found a genetic variant for vascular EDS. But after their doctor forwarded these results to a genetics department, the genetics department wouldn't see them because the exact location of the variant is new and hasn't been seen before. Is this a mistake on the half on the side of the genetics department, or is it possibly being confused with a false positive? Um, what can they do to get the support and help they need? So I missed the first part of that question. Was this a consumer ordered genetic test or a clinical genetic test? It was a clinical genetic test with their primary physician um, who it. forwarded the results on to a genetics department. Okay. So without knowing the specifics about the variant, um, I'm not going to be a whole lot of help, but definitely if it was a variant of uncertain significance, um, a lot of genetics departments will say, you know, what, we don't know what to tell you about that. It's, it's not classified at this point, and we know that those are common. Um, if it was truly a pathogenic variant, then I would expect that that was a mistake on the part of the genetics clinic, um, because if it's classified as pathogenic, I think they would want to see you. So my guess is it was probably a variant of uncertain significance. Um, and sometimes that can be really frustrating and scary for families, but a genetics clinic isn't necessarily going to know better what to tell you about that than your primary care doctor does if there just isn't enough evidence to know what it means right now. All righty. In the, case, in the case of HEDS, um, is presence of other diagnosed conditions like mast cell or things like POTS helpful for the diagnosis of that since it's not actually diagnosable by an actual genetic test yet? Yeah, um, certainly those things are worth talking about with your provider. Um, we know that they kind of can go along with hypermobile EDS, um, but we also know that some people have like mast cell disease without having hypermobile EDS, so it's hard to know. Sometimes it gets really confusing as to which symptoms are due to this diagnosis and which are due to that diagnosis. Um, so it's definitely, um, I think you're right, something to bring up with your provider, but it might or might not actually help get to that definitive HEDS diagnosis. All righty. Um, we have a question with wording, and I know this has been a question I've heard um, from a couple people. Isn't it only considered a provisional diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome until the other types of EDS are ruled out? If so, why won't many genetic clinics test a patient who has suspected HEDS to rule out the other types? Sure. So um, I can tell you what we do in our clinic um, if we're evaluating somebody and we think, you know, this person really fits with HEDS and they don't have signs that make us suspicious for other types of EDS. We don't do genetic testing to rule out other types of EDS um, because there typically are some clinical signs, at least um, with all of the rarer types that we um, would think about. You know, if we do a really good clinical examination, and keep in mind that, you know, Peter Byers, who's our medical geneticist, has seen more people with vascular EDS than probably almost anyone else in the world. And so he really is able to do a clinical evaluation and say, you don't have this. Um, I am not concerned about this for you. You fit into this hypermobile EDS category. So there are some geneticists who are experienced enough to really... Um, you know, sort of figure out where you fit without having to do genetic testing to rule things out if you don't have any clinical signs that make them concerned for that other type. I, I know that's really frustrating for patients sometimes because they don't feel comfortable without that piece of paper. There are a couple of laboratories that offer genetic testing that is clinical that patients can order themselves. And so I've had some folks who will go and order their own clinical genetic test, or they'll get their primary care provider to order it because they just aren't going to be happy and comfortable until they have that negative um, EDS panel. But a lot of genetics clinics, because there's such a shortage of providers, don't want to do that work for you if they really are clear that you don't have, that they're not suspicious that you have one of the other types. It's a good question. Right. How can a patient become involved in contacting labs about updates? Many geneticists do not follow patients, and patients are blocked from accessing their own test results. Any tips on how to keep communication lines open? Yeah, so if you know the laboratory where your testing was done, which you should be able to get that information, your geneticist should certainly share a copy of that test result with you, um, or it should be in your medical record that you can access. Um, you can try calling the lab itself. Some of them will talk to patients and some of them will say, have your provider contact us. Um, 
But the other thing that you could do sometimes is if you get a different provider, if your genetics provider is not accessible and they're too busy and they're not going to help you, sometimes you can get a primary care provider or somebody else who's working with you to sort of take on that work and they can call the laboratory and say, hey, you know, I'm a new provider working with this patient. Are there any updates on this variant of uncertain significance? Um, things like that. So sometimes just getting any healthcare provider involved is a way to get through to the laboratory. Alrighty, um, we've actually got a follow up on a question that was asked earlier about the variant of uncertain significance. Um, if you've already got the um, results that say that you do have the variant of uncertain significance, mm -hmm. is somebody like Dr. Byers, can he do a quick appointment since there's already proof or is that going to be still a full appointment with a workup? So if you've already had genetic testing um, and you have a variant of uncertain significance, we may or may not recommend coming to see us at all um, because, um, you know, typically there's not much that we're going to be able to add. If you've already had sort of an evaluation clinically and you know what signs and symptoms you have and the genetic test didn't confirm a diagnosis of something, you can always get referred to a genetics clinic like us and have your referral reviewed. I usually look at those variants if somebody gets referred. And if I'm really suspicious, if I feel like, oh, this variant might actually be pathogenic, then we would bring somebody in. But if we look at it and we're like, yeah, this really is uncertain significance. We, we don't know right now. Then we're not going to add anything new um, to the workup that somebody's already had. Sounds good. And we're just about close to the end of our time. So we've got one last question. Um, I was able to order a whole genome and exome um, test. I've received those results on a hard drive and would love to poke around on my, for my own amusement. Do you have any recommendations for a software a consumer can use to parse their own data? Oof. Or would you recommend against that? So, you know, I think if you're doing it for your own amusement, that's absolutely fine. Um, I don't know any particular program that I would recommend. I haven't looked at any of them really, so I don't know which ones are going to have good science behind them, if any. I'm not really sure who's offering anything for consumers. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell you about that. But I, I mean, I don't, it's your genetic information. I think if you want to look at it, you should be able to look at it, um, just with the understanding that if you're to make health decisions, you probably want to involve somebody, um, somebody else who's done a little bit more um, training and figuring out what the genetics means. Alrighty. Thank you so much, everyone, for such great questions. Um, but that is, unfortunately, all the time we have for our webinar today. If you would like more information about anything that was presented today, please check out our website for more resources and information. Feel free to give our helpline a call or an email. And definitely consider signing up for our newsletter if you haven't already. It's a fantastic source for the most up-to-date information and upcoming events. Our next webinar will be on August 7th. We have Dr. William Erickson presenting on the evaluation and treatment of thumb, wrist, and arm pain and weakness in hypermobile patients. You can look out for that sign up for our next webinar shortly. Again, thank you so much, Lauren. Your presentation was extremely informative and very helpful. Technology permitting, this webinar should be available on our YouTube channel within the next few weeks. Um, barring technical difficulties and obviously with the conference coming up, there's not going to be as much time to get things done until after. Um, but if you found this webinar at all helpful, please consider hitting that like button once the webinar is available on YouTube and subscribing to our channel so that you can be alerted when we upload new videos. Also, there is a donation button on our main YouTube page along with a link in the uploaded webinars. It's thanks to donations that allow us to continue to provide programs like our webinars, along with other great projects and research we're undertaking. Once again, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you to all of our attendees and your participation. I hope everyone that joined us has a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.